I mentioned a lot. I said something about this a little bit last week, but I do mention a lot about how we feel when we come to worship together. And if we were all to take turns this morning and say, how many of us feel tired? And many would raise our hands. How many of us feel frustrated, some more fearful? We'd have hands all over the place. If we talked about our feelings, uh, even if we all shared what fear was, we would conflict with each other. Well, I'm scared and this is what causes me fear. And others would say, no, 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 you shouldn't have fear because of that. That's just silly. This is what you should fear. Anxiety, doubt, self-worth, self-esteem. We often even look at those types of things in our walk with Christ. We even sometimes don't even know what that means. Well, what does it mean to walk with Christ? So I've got to act a certain way and speak a certain language, carry a certain Bible, be in a certain place, at a certain time, at a certain church. And then there's others that say, well, you know, my walk with the Lord is just me and myself and I and Jesus. The self-trinity with Jesus on the edge and everything is well. And it is well with my soul. And then others who would be the picture of piety and the picture of faith would turn and say to those, well, I'm the most wretched of sinners. And I can never overcome the sin of my life. And I never feel like I'm good enough or worthy enough and there's a whole gambit of different thoughts and responses that come when we consider ourselves in light of righteousness in light of the cultural dictation of what christianity is in light of our own experiences we all come here every time we gather together with different fears and different thoughts and different feelings and the only constant in this well there's several constants the only constants that we see is that number one we gather together and we gather together we gather together with our garbage piled upon our hearts and minds and shoulders and we all come and we all look at each other and go man I wish I didn't have burdens like they don't have burdens <laughs> and that's a lie each of us has a burden or 12 or 40 or 1000 that's beyond our scope of ability. That's beyond in our own minds, whether I shared with you some of the burdens I had, and you went, you know what, why does that bother you? You shouldn't be bothered by that. Oh, why is that a... And you share burdens with me, and I'm thinking, man, I could handle that all day. Well, we cannot handle our own, can we? But we seem sometimes to be able to see through the problems of each other. Beloved, God has established the local assembly so that we can do that. And let me, let me share something with you here. Is that if we are not intimate in our conversation, if we are not intimate in our investment in each other's lives, if we're not honest, there's never ministry. There's never ministry. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. Praise the Lord. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Woo! -hoo! I mean, you know, when inside we really are dead. When in the depths of our mind we're just worried about tomorrow and what it will bring. We don't want people to figure out who we really are as we put up these fronts and we, we think that there's, 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 there's a solidity in that and there's a strength in that. But friends, when we hide the truth, we are weak. We are frail. We are broken. And we are in, in a place where we might just one turn or one sneeze or one wail fall off the cliff. Never to climb back up. When we look at the Word of God together, church, it is through the hearing of this Word that we are encouraged, that we are supported, that we are undergirded. It is through the teaching of Scripture that God the Holy Spirit moves in our lives. There's no place where we can come to find God for He does not exist in a place. There is no particular people who are gifted above other people to have some spiritual essence about them. The apostles are no more. They are gone. We have their words and through their words is how God works. No man is more holy or spiritual than any other man. There's not a rapist in prison that's any more wicked than I am. Friends, there is no place to find the Lord except through Scripture. 
And God uses the natural means of language written on these pages through which His Holy Spirit brings to life a dead man who cannot see His glory. To which He takes, takes a people who could never get along, who could never love each other, who could never be honest, who could never invest in each other's lives. And boom, by the power of His grace, He gives us some supernatural spontaneous affection that overrides all the wisdom and common sense of the world. Friends, we are looking, if we're looking apart from the Word of God and outside the assembly of God's people, if we're looking for hope and joy and peace, we will never find it. If we're thinking that we're going to have a, a, a firm foundation in anything but the Word of God, the Bible itself says that it's sinking sand. That's it. It's sinking sand. Nothing else can we stand upon except the rock of our salvation who is not Peter for the love of God. It is not Grace Truth Church. It is not the right hymns or the right doctrinal historical position. It is Jesus Christ alone. He is the rock of salvation. He is the glory of God revealed perfectly to us. He is the I am. And that's what this text teaches us. This morning I pray that as the Word of God is read to you, that the Lord would give hearing to your ears. Let's do the prologue one more time together. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And in him, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light... The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own and His own people did not receive Him, but to all who did receive Him, those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at His Father's side. He has made Him known. Let's pray. Father, please, Lord, we pray that Your will be done. But Lord, we ask of You this day to give light and hope to those who are lost among us. Father, to secure Your children with the power of your gospel to help us see that it is not in us to hold ourselves and save our souls to help us see that it is not any part of us there is no part of us father that can come into your presence and behold your glory but you brought yourself down God, you brought yourself down. Jesus Christ, the Son, who is the God-man, came to dwell among us. You have sent your glory to dwell among your people as a person. <clears throat> Father, you've revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ in this word this morning. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us the hope and the peace and the security that, we've all, that we all long for every moment. Father, as we grow as a church, as a gathered people, as a family of faith, Lord, you know what the enemy is doing. 
You know how He is coming against our homes, our minds, our bodies. Lord, you know how He's coming against our consciences and we are just thinking differently in some aspects of our assembly. Father, there are many of us who feel overwhelmed with sin, overwhelmed with addiction, overwhelmed with anger, overwhelmed, Lord, with whatever it may be. Father, you are the God of heaven who by your word created all things and by your word, Lord, you will give us a way of escape. Father, it is not in us, but it is in Jesus Christ, whose life is worthy of praise, whose life as a human being you call your righteousness, and Father, whose death satisfied your justice. May we believe on Christ this day for the answer to all of life and most assuredly, to eternal life and it's in his name we pray amen the word became flesh and dwelt among us we've spent several weeks on this looking at the glory of god glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth and while i would love to spend six or seven weeks dealing with that we will spend the next few years showing what the scripture teaches about the glory of god in christ so this morning, I want to move into these next verses, but I want to skip some and then go back and then I'm going to come back. So it's going to be a little off for us in sequence, but I want us to look now at verse 17. You see, there is the word for, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So what we have now, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory of God. Glory is the only Son for the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist bore witness and said he was from before, came after me, came before me because he was before me. For from the fullness of Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, who is God, who was in the beginning, that came to be a man, we have received all the visible glory of God, we have seen all the revelation of God in every piece and all perfection. There is no mystery hidden from us about God that will ever be revealed to us that's not revealed in Jesus Christ. And from all of His fullness we receive grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. You see this contrast. I want to focus on that for a second so that we have the right understanding of the law in our minds as we back up and then go through this text. The law was given by God to Moses for his people. You know the story. We see how God brought them out of Egypt through the hands of a murderer as his spokesperson. Moses, a murderer who was hiding because he murdered an Egyptian. Though he grew up in the palace arms, if you will, of Egypt, he was a criminal. He murdered an Egyptian. And God called Moses, who could not speak very well at all, to go back into Egypt and to walk into the throne room of the king, the Pharaoh, and to just say with bold words, actually he would have his brother Aaron say them because he couldn't speak as eloquently or as clearly as he should. That was his excuse when God called him. He says, well, here's a stick and take your brother. And that's the way God works, right? We give an excuse and God gives us a nonsensical object. Here's a stick. Oh, you're scared? Take a stick. Oh, you're alone? Take your brother. Who do you think I am? I'm God. I created the world. I created the voice that you can't use. So here's a stick. I can do more with this stick than you can do with your entire life something to think about and Aaron and Moses stood before Pharaoh and Moses guilty of murder possibly could have been killed at any moment and arrested but, but by God's providence through the murder of Hebrew children Moses was spared generations before where his own mother hid him in a basket and put him out in a waterway and he was found by a member of the king's court a member of the royal family. And then he was given back to his mother, a Jewish slave, to raise. Because God, in the midst of all horror, has a perfect and sovereign plan. 
and nothing can stop it. And Moses grew and murdered and left and returned. And he said, let the people of God go. You see? And Pharaoh went, not going to happen. And God poured wrath and justice upon Egypt. And when justice and wrath and judgment was poured upon Egypt, Pharaoh's heart relented and repented. When punishment came his way, he's like, I'm sorry, I quit, I give up. And then when God says, I will be gracious, and he took the plagues away, and things got back to normal, Pharaoh changed his mind. And the grace of God hardened the heart of Pharaoh against God. And the Bible teaches us in Romans that God raised up Pharaoh for the exact purpose to be an instrument of destruction, an object of wrath, that he may show his glory and his justice. No, he's not talking about Egypt. He's talking about Pharaoh, the man. And Esau, the man that he hated. God delivered Israel out of the hands of slavery, out of the hands and the powerful grip of Egypt through miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And when they got to safety, they encamped around the base of Mount Sinai and the tempest of, uh, formed and God's glory appeared through cloud and smoke and lightning and thunder and it frightened them. And Moses had to go up into the midst of of God's holiness and God's glory. And God spoke to Moses and with his hand he wrote the law of his righteous requirements and his demands upon the tablets. And Moses came down after hearing the voice of God and spending time in the presence of the glory of God's righteousness. And he finds that his brother Aaron had melted all the gold and created a calf and worshipped it with the whole number of Israel. And God swallowed them up and disemboweled their bodies by the sword because they deserved it. But He did not do that to all of them. He just did a portion. He'd have been just and righteous and loving and good and, and pleasant and worthy of all praise and honor had He swallowed every Israelite and even Moses himself hurled him into the abyss and brought him into everlasting judgment. But God had made a covenant to create a people for Himself. And He showed them that the only way they could stand before Him righteous was to know His law and obey it with absolute perfection. And before they even heard it, they were guilty of violating the very first one to love the Lord your God with all your heart. To have no other gods before you. And they worshiped a golden calf. And in anger, Moses throws and breaks those tablets and has to go back again and see, the, hear the voice of God give the law one more time. And when he goes to leave, Moses asks one question of God. He says, can I see your glory? And God says, no one can see me and live. I will show you as I walk by the back of the train of my robe. The presence of God is so mighty and glorious that Moses' physical face glowed. And all throughout the instruction, these people hearing, they begged, they begged that no more words come from the mountain. Don't, we don't want to hear it anymore. And when Moses came down from the mountain, they said, hide your face. For you have been with God and we can't bear to see your glory. The glory of God reflecting from your face. Hide your face. You see the problem we have here? We can't look upon God, y'all. We cannot gaze into His face. We cannot see His glory. We cannot behold Him and embrace Him and be in intimate relationship with Him because we are sinners and we are worthy of His righteousness. We are worthy of His justice. We are worthy of His condemnation because we do not stand holy and perfect before Him. So the law came through Moses. And the law is what is required of every man every woman and every child with absolute perfection. 
And there's a little bit of an irony here as the way Israel took the law. After all, they had already violated it. Friends, if you have broken the law, are you ever not a lawbreaker? No. You may have a long run of obedience, but if you've broken the law of God, you are guilty thereof of breaking all the law of God. God did not give ten. He gave His law. And the law is right and required of all men. The law is based on the works of men to follow perfectly after the righteousness of God, to be as God is in complete pattern, to follow after Him in absolute lockstep, not looking to the left or the right, much less stepping there, not considering other options. To follow the law of God is to be God Himself, beloved, and stand perfectly aligned and say, I am God. That's what it means to obey the law of God. And only one man has ever obeyed the law of God. And he was God himself. But the Israelites could not see it. They were just looking to the temporal. They were looking to the temporal like Nicodemus in John 3. How can I be born again? Go back into my mother's womb and return? They're like the temporal mindset of the... Samaritan woman from Sychar in John 4 that says, How are you to give me living water when you have no bucket to dip it with? Or like his disciples at the end of that discourse where they come and they say, Eat, Master. He says, I have food that you know not of. And they thought, Who gave him something to eat? And he says, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Or when he says in John 6, Do not labor for the bread that perishes, but labor for the food that endures to eternal life. I am the bread that comes down from heaven to give life to all men. And they have the audacity to say, what sign do you bring that we might believe? Israelites saw the law as an opportunity to make themselves right before God. Israelites saw the law as a, as, as a man hoped centered ability to follow after God and thus appease the righteousness of God and the justice of God. If they just follow the rules, they'll be right. Beloved, that is a lie. You cannot follow the rules and be right. And that's the conflict that John is imposing here. Be careful when you hear and you listen to sermons on John's gospel who people have a project in mind and they have a, a position that they want to impose upon the scripture and they make it sound right but in context it's stupid people will twist scripture to fill the coffers of their offerings they will twist scripture to get a following say, oh look at pastor wow what a great guy they will twist scripture to build themselves an empire to have a following after their ideals and principles. And anyone who says that they follow after Christ and they worship a man and they worship a ministry and they worship the fruits thereof have not seen Christ. Because the law is works. And no man can establish works that are righteous before God. As a matter of fact, the prophet of old said that the righteous works of men are filthy rags before a holy God. Jesus imposes the same reality through the parable where he talks about the slaves that are owned by their masters who are working for their food and clothing. And if they do not work, they will not have clothes and if they don't work they will not eat and he says does the slave work hard all day in the field and when we come into dinner do i say oh slave you've worked so hard sit recline put your feet up and dine with me he says no slave where's my supper that's jesus that is exactly out of the mouth of jesus what's the point that's mean jesus wasn't endorsing slavery he was just saying that a slave was not rewarded for doing what a slave was required to do Beloved, we are not rewarded for obeying the law of God. 
We cannot earn salvation. We cannot earn righteousness. We cannot earn good favor. We cannot earn the glance of God's affection. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of New Testament passages. Every letter of the New Testament. Every gospel writer. And John's apocalypse. Every letter teaches us that God has saved the people in spite of them for the sake of His glorious name that He may be glorified in the grace given to them. And grace by definition is an unmerited gift. Not an offer. Not an opportunity. Not a privilege. But is a gift that no one can earn and no one can grasp. And no one can take for themselves. You see the difference in the God of the world that's worshipped for what man can do. And the God of Scripture who is the God of heaven that is worshipped for what He has done. The law brings death. Paul would say to the Philippians, according to the law of Moses, I am blameless. You know that? In other words, he said, if you follow me around my whole life since I was a boy, eight days old, and circumcised, given the name of Israel's first king, Saul, the Jew of all Jews, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees, according to the law, blameless, you would have walked in my entire life and heard every thought that I had, and I never sinned against the law of God. And he was right, according to the way he followed it. But yet he said when the law came and his eyes were opened, he saw that it brought death. For even in all of his staunch piety and all of his perfect pursuit of following the rules, it did not merit him righteous salvation. Could not merit him righteous salvation. The Word became flesh. The law was given through Moses. The law is a witness to righteousness. According to Romans 3, come on Wednesday nights if you want to learn more about this doctrine. Romans 3 says that the righteousness of God is manifested apart from the law. Though the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God is manifested apart. That means it, it's established and visible. It exists apart from the law. In Jesus Christ. That the righteousness of God is manifested through the putting of Jesus on the cross. That the Bible says that God the Father put Jesus on the cross in order to be a noun propitiation. Jesus is the satisfaction of God's judgment against His people to be received by God is a maniacal God. No, He's not. He's a righteous God. Perfect in all His ways. And glorious. And worthy of all praise. The law is a witness to righteousness because it displays and depicts holiness. It requires holiness. It demands justice. It indicts sinners. And it convicts the guilty. And beloved... All of us are guilty. Every one of us are guilty before God. So what are we to do? John is showing what God has done. What has God done? The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to say anything else about that until the end of the sermon. The righteousness of God manifested apart from the law is that no man can be righteous by the works of the law and no man can put stock and security in his works and no man can have faith in the fruit of his faith and have security of his eternal life. And let's go back to verse 15. Verse 15, John, not the gospel writer, not the evangelist here, but John the Baptist whose head was taken from his body at the command of Herod's wife. John bore witness about him. What is this talking about? As you'll see John the Baptist in just a few verses, um, we'll see a little bit of him next week. John the Baptist 
was born as the precursor to Christ, as the one who's the forerunner of Christ, to come and declare, make straight the paths of the Lord. The kingdom of God is at hand. And then he says, as we'll see in a minute, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And here is a, real, is, a, is a foreshadowing of the rest of this narrative that John bore witness. That means he cried out, this was a, he of whom I said, he who comes after me. Because Jesus was born after John. Jesus showed up on his public ministry after John's public ministry had started. He comes after me, the, he ranks before me. Because He was before me. You see that? Jesus Christ is what? In the beginning was the Word. Jesus Christ is the God of eternity. Jesus Christ is before all things and the Creator of all. He's just reminding us that John bore witness to what he's writing. Peter would say the same thing. Paul would say the same thing to the church of Colossae, to the church of Rome, to the church of Galatia the church of Philippi, to the church of Thessalonica. In John 8, 56, Jesus has the audacity, 56, 57, 58, He says, Abraham rejoiced to look forward to my day, this is a paraphrase, and in my day he was glad he saw it. And they said, what are you, what are you talking about? Verse 57 of John, of John 8, what are you talking about? You are not yet 50, yet you say you've seen Abraham. And He says, before Abraham was, I am. He ranks before us because He is eternal. He is the God of heaven. Beloved, this is not just some narrative showing us about the historical excellencies of the work of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles. This is an exposition. This is an expository reality. This is a supernatural revelation of Jesus Christ divine. Jesus Christ is God. In all attributes, He is God fully, eternally. Isaiah 6, you know that text. It's referenced several times in John. John chapter 12 specifically. But it says, I see the Lord. And it is what? It is what? His glory fills the temple. I see the Lord and He's high and lifted up. That's Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 3. I see the Lord high and lifted up. Jesus in John chapter 12 verse 41, He says, Isaiah saw my glory and wrote of it. And spoke of it. Now we see the glory of God. We see the glory of God as Jesus Christ as depicted just in the gospel. He's the word. He's the light. He's the true light. He's the light of the world. He's the son of man. He's teacher. He's prophet. He's God. He's the son of God. He's God's one and only son. He's the son of God who has come into the world according to Martha. He is the Lord. He is the great I Am. As a matter of fact, there are seven I Am statements that Jesus makes about Himself. 2028. 20, <laughs> what does Thomas say? The Lord of me and the God of me. He is my Lord. He is my God. He is the Holy One of God. Chapter 6, verse 68, 69. The Messiah. The King of Israel. The Bridegroom. The One who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ is the one who comes from heaven, the one who comes from above, the one who God has sent. He is the bread of life. He is the bread of God. He comes down. He is the giver of life. He is the living water. He is the one that the Father has sent apart from Him into the world. He is the Lamb. He's the Savior. What other title do we need? He's the resurrection. He's the door. He's the gate. He's the great shepherd. He's the true vine. He is the truth. He's the way. He's the life. And it goes on and on and on. Throughout 20 some odd, I don't know how many hundreds and, or thousands of words are in here, but this gospel, everything in it, shows that Jesus ranks before all things. And in verse 15, it's to remind us that the writers of this text are not writing of their own accord. They're not writing so that we can just say, okay, we put together this plan to create this historical figure who 
we can say now is God. It's a consistent testimony. It has a stream, a thread, a, a single line that runs through the Old Testament to the New Testament as far as texts. But most assuredly, that God has given testimony of His Son. As we'll see in John 5. In verse 16. And from His fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. I'm going to tag this at the end again too. What does this mean? Well, if we were to take it literally, grace that replaces grace that replaces grace that replaces grace. You might say, well, what is the grace? Now, I like the ingenuity of some Bible scholars who determine their understanding, interpretation of Scripture outside of Scripture. So they go, well, that's really neat. This is what's on the page. Let's come up with our own idea. And they agree it is schematic. And they go, well, this is pretty neat. So that must mean that the grace of God through the law was one grace. Now there's another grace that replaces that. Friends, the grace of God in the law is not grace. It's a holy requirement. Now it's gracious that God should show us the law, for without the knowledge of the law, there is no knowledge of sin, according to Paul. So the law is a teacher to show us our inability to follow it. The law is a teacher to reveal to us the righteousness of God. The law is a teacher to show us our guilt before God. Romans 3 and other places. Romans 1 and 2 basically establishes God's judgment and His guilt. I mean in the guilt, excuse me, the guilt that all humanity has. But the grace here upon grace upon grace, grace that comes continually, replacing itself most abundantly. This is not the law and other covenants and now Christ. That's a farce. It is supposed to impose the absolute efficacy that, that grace through Jesus Christ is sufficient for all things. That grace is given through God and that He has accomplished it by the means of grace. Everything is in the hand of God. Every step is in the hand of God. Every action. Every reaction. Everything. It's in the hand of God by grace. What in the world is so important about grace? Well, it is by grace alone that you are saved through faith. What is faith? Faith is trusting in the grace of God, who is Jesus Christ. What do you mean trusting? I'm helpless. Help me, God. Oh, Jesus, you're my only hope. That's the mindset of grace. That's the, that's the expression of grace from a, from a verbal point of view. Saying those words do not, does not make one saved. Trusting in Jesus Christ. Believing in Jesus Christ. It's a present reality, not a point in history. It's not a future, it's not a future ability. It is an absolute true promise of God. It's a declaration of what God has done because of His kindness. Because of His mercy. Because of His love toward His people. In spite of them. They are objects of mercy. Grace upon grace upon grace. I mean, we could then say, well, there is some graciousness to God in some actual ways. But we understand that when Scripture talks about grace from a salvific point of view, it is talking about God's effectual grace that works salvation in the hearts and lives of His people perfectly. That Jesus is an absolute Savior who came to seek and save the lost and He did just that. And He propitiated. He became the satisfaction of God's wrath for people. He paid for the sins of certain people. It's not a check that God wrote through the blood of Christ that we have to go cash. It's a check that God wrote through the blood of Christ that He paid the debt with. The debt is paid. You can't go pay a debt that is not owed. Beloved, we, don't, we cannot pay our debt to God. We cannot pay our debt to God. Christ has paid it. Christ has paid it. We could say that the grace of God upon grace upon grace is the very fact that we exist for the glory of God. That is a work of grace. We can say that grace is like the grace of sight of being able to see the glory of God and behold and understand. We can say that God's grace is seen in the new birth of the dead man. 
so that when we become believers, we are made new to the glorious grace of God and to the praise of His glory. We can say that grace is, is, is found in eternal life. The proclamation of the power of God through grace and the work of Jesus Christ for the sake of His name. We can say all of these things. But most importantly, we should say that the Scripture is teaching us that there is no possible means through which we can know and experience eternal life except by the grace of God that is continually flowing from the person of Jesus who is the giver of all grace all the time and there is nothing we can do to bend His hand or heart toward anyone that He does not apply His grace to. How is the grace applied? We hear the word of God and by the grace of God, the ears are opened and the life is quickened and we believe. It's called the new birth. And it precedes faith. It comes before faith. For if my cognitive expression of truth and acceptance of the reality of God is the causal agent of God's rebirth, then I'm the boss. Church, we come together to preach to the church, to teach to the church, to learn as God's people. We're not here to cater to blind and dead people. We are here to proclaim the good news to the dead and to encourage each other through the good news of Jesus Christ. That we might understand the depths of God's love for us. It's not in giving us mansions and good health because that all will pass away. Of course, He gives them. All good gifts come from above is what James says. We won't get into James 4 today, but read that. But eternal life is of God. So, verse 16, grace upon grace, have that mindset. Now we're back to where we started. Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, verse 18, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. See, there's a contrast here for the sake of clarity. There's a contrast between the law that came through Moses that we've already discussed in the beginning so that we didn't have a wrong interpretation of what the law is and the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. The law equals death. As Grace Truth Church, it's our namesake. It comes from this text comes right from this place from this section of text we exist as a people by the grace of God for the sake of his glory we exist by grace and truth for the sake of grace and truth for the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord it is by grace and truth that you are saved beloved so I see no other fitting name to call ourselves publicly rather than the red brick Baptist Church or, or the wig shop Baptist Church or the gas station Baptist Church or Park Avenue Baptist Church or whatever. Ugly bunch of folks, some of us not Baptist Church. I mean, you know, us guys, we gotta be honest. Red Carpet Baptist Church, Green Door Baptist Church, Blue Hymnal Baptist Church, these are real names. Because of what's defined people. What defines you as a believer in Jesus Christ? The grace and the truth of God, who is Christ. Moses gave the law. And most of the Jews loved Moses. They endeared him to, to, to death. They followed God's law and thus felt justified, but they were really dead. Jesus shows us that in the New Testament. You are whitewashed tombs. You are dogs. You are broods of vipers. You are wicked. You are dead. Your father is not Abraham, nor is it Moses. It's Satan. These are the words of Jesus to the Jews to the most religious, most pious people, to the people that Paul was a part of, who never disobeyed the Lord according to the law of Moses. But yet in everything they did right, they disobeyed the Lord more and more. Because they did it not by faith. They followed after the law because they felt it would justify them before the Lord in such a way that they deserved, get this, they deserved eternal life. They deserved God's grace. They deserved God's mercy. They deserved it. We deserve it. You hear me tell the story about the young... Hebrew man who came in his 20s to our church in California and after had, had been converted by the gospel. But his family was still staunch Orthodox Jew, Jews. And we talked for a long time after service and his words to me, as I said just a few weeks ago, was that I have a problem with, with free grace. I have a problem with sovereign grace. It bothers me in my, 
my mind, even though I know it's necessary, because all of my family, and holy as they are, and as pious, they don't even light a stove on Saturday. They don't flip switches. We have autom- our whole house is automated for the Sabbath. Because we don't want to violate the law of God. We follow this, and we follow that, and we follow this, and we follow that. He said, it really hurts me that my family can't see that all their good works does nothing. But it's by the grace of God that I can see. He would confess. Moses gave the law, and this law demands righteousness. But what's the contrast? What's the clarity about grace in contrast to the law? The law demands righteousness, but grace gifts righteousness. You see. The law demands righteousness, and if we don't have righteousness, then we suffer the consequence of not having righteousness to the law. The law cannot give us righteousness even in our obedience to it. You might be thinking now, well, why can't I obey the law of God? Have you done it? Have you never sinned? Well, you did just then, thinking that you were righteous because you'd never sinned. Well, man, if I, if I was trained right as an infant... Some people would argue. And as I train right as an infant and I walk in the statutes of God and I, and I learn never to commit sin. See, some people will tell you that man is guilty before God only when they commit willful sin. All right, let's just for the sake of funness, like we're trying to do a comedy show right now, let's just say that's true. And let's all who have children reflect back upon their birth and their first few months of life. And this little bundle of joy is crying when it comes out sometimes. And you're thinking, well, that's not sin. He's just scared. Oh. Is fear not sin? It is when we're not trusting in Jesus. Well, he doesn't know. He's not cognitively aware that there's sin there. So he's not purposefully committing. Okay, let's just give that child a few more days. Take it home. We bathe it. We nurse it. We feed it. You know, we sing it, bounce it, read it stories. We tear it around to the arthritic symptoms start in. We don't sleep for like 70 years. We go broke. One of my kids asked me yesterday, why do people have children if they're so expensive? I said, I've been waiting to figure that out for 19 years. (laughs) It's worth it. But here's here's the reality. When do you first see children sin? Way before they can ever say the word mine, they act on it. Way before when they've got that pretty little dangly earring on auntie's ear or granny's ear. And they're like three months old and they're pulling at me. And you say, no, no. And they scream and kick. What is that? That's sin. Oh, man, now this guy's crazy saying babies are sinners. Friends, we're all sinners. And it gets worse when we get older, you know. Great, great, great Aunt Lucy, who's 170. She's never said a bad word in her life that we know of. She's outlived all of her children. She's so sweet, she carries a Bible in both hands, laces them to her feet. She's praising Jesus all the time. She's not really praising, she's like, please come get me. I mean, you know, why am I alive so long? And people go, well, no, 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 no. Oh, great, great, great Aunt Lucy is never, she's a perfect person. She's a, and she's sitting there thinking, you are crazy. She doesn't hear us saying it because her ears are gone. I mean, <laughs> no one is not a sinner. We all fall short of the glory of God, and we all deserve His justice. Jesus Christ took the penalty of our sin on Himself so that the justice of God is satisfied. Friends, we have a false view of humanity. And any of us who would sit in here and think that we're a better person than the person next to us, we may be better at some things. Somebody may be able to play the guitar or the saxophone or speak French or, or whatever it may be better than somebody else. Or someone may be able to clean the house better or do landscaping better or cook better or maybe even follow the rules a little bit better or know the Bible a little bit more. It doesn't make us more righteous. And even the following after Christ and and, and doing things that honor Christ with our lives as believers. We can't sit there and go, you know, I'm really growing in my faith. man. I'm really growing in my faith. Look how well I'm obeying. And then three hours later, you like cuss the guy out in front of you because he pulled out in traffic. The problem is we think that that internal profanity of our mind, 
I sound like Yosemite Sam, you know that? That was actually clouded profanity when we were children, teaching us to have road rage. We're thinking that that invisible sin of frustration and anger poured toward this person that they don't know and nobody else knows, so the no harm, no foul. Friends, it's a sin against God. And it's deserving of eternal punishment. There is no hope for us if Christ has not paid for our sins. There is no hope for us if God has not established some payment for our iniquities. And Jesus Christ is the only one who has done that. The law demands righteousness. The grace of God gifts righteousness. The law pays the sinner for his due violation. The grace of God satisfies God's wrath through Jesus Christ. The law blesses perfection through absolute obedience, which is impossible, but grace blesses the violator with life. The law reveals God's judgment. The grace of God reveals God's mercy. The grace of God regenerates the sinner and restores intimacy with God. So the question now is what now? So what? So what? Friends, what else is there? What, what else do you want to hear this morning? My prayers is not an antsiness in your spirit that this is an ill-timed sermon or an ill-pointed message and that there's something here that just doesn't quite rest well with your soul so you just want to dismiss the rest of the text. Friends, listen to me. Don't fall prey to the deception of the enemy. Because what I'm saying today, though I know it is true, because of the Spirit of God that gives testimony to it, that's not enough for you to believe me. You must see it with your own eyes and you must hear it with your own ears and you must believe it in your heart. And the Lord of heaven will do that for you as you come week after week to hear the Scripture, as you take a Bible home with you and as you read it and as you study it. And even by the Spirit of God prompted to pray, Lord, show me the truth. I just don't like what I'm hearing right now. And then all of a sudden it will settle and be well with your soul. And you will see so what's the outcome? Where's the application, Pastor, of all this incredible Christology? Where's the application? Where's the rubber hit the road for this kind of stuff? Well, how about this? Rejoice. That is the one, two, three home run. That is the grand slam of most cults that knock on your doors. Can I help you? Are you looking for joy and peace? I've been looking for it forever. Yes. Who's not? The liar. No. Go in here and sulk. We're all looking for joy and peace. We're all looking for that place where we're not enamored with life. So rejoice that Christ has satisfied the wrath of God. Rejoice that God has come down. He has condescended. Rejoice that we stand justified before God because of the work of Jesus. Rejoice that we are empowered by God to live together as a people for His glory. Rejoice that we are forgiven and we can forgive each other no matter how horrible the infraction. Rejoice that we are loved no matter how well we obey or how well we disobey because if we're honest, even in our obedience, it's not really all obedience. Rejoice. That we have intimacy with God. See? For verse 16, for from His fullness we've all received grace upon grace. See, so the coming of Jesus Christ is knowing God. And knowing God is eternal life. John 16, John 17. 3. John 17, 3. And if we look back up at 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Friends, the law was given through Moses. Catch this. Grace and truth came through Jesus. You see that? God gave Moses the law and Moses gave it to us. And we look at him and go desperately, go, okay, I'm going to do my best. The best doesn't work. And we fail. 
So God, before the law was ever given, before the world was ever created, purposed to send grace in the person of Jesus Christ. Grace came down. I don't hear what I'm not saying, church. I'm not saying that the law doesn't have its place. The law is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the commands of Scripture that we see, the exhortation, the admonishment, the rebukes, the training in righteousness that we see in the Scripture is for us to take heed and, and to follow after and to do so to, together collectively that we might encourage each other lest we be disqualified for the sake of the name of Christ. But none of those things can take us to God. God came to us. And He snatched us out of the domain of darkness. He snatched us out of death. And He's brought us to the life of the light of the life eternal in Jesus. Grace has come to you, beloved. The grace of God is before you this day through the hearing of the good news of Jesus, which we call the gospel. My prayer is that you would see and hear and behold and that you would believe by the grace and mercy of God. In church, that as we continue to traverse this incredibly painful place we call life, that we would have encouragement through the work of Christ. And know that no matter how bad it may seem to us, there are brothers and sisters across this world throughout history who have suffered very, very deep martyrdom and consequences for believing on Jesus Christ. And they've done so with joy. Not to make light of our suffering, but let's keep it in perspective. We are in a good place. Let us not take for granted the light momentary affliction that prepares us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison as we look to that which is unseen, not to that which is seen. Let's look to Christ this morning. Let's pray. We love You, Father. We praise You, Lord, for Your ineffable glory and Your absolute mercy, Your effectual grace, for Your love toward us in Jesus Christ that He satisfied the burden of obedience. He lived the life that we are required to live and never could. And He satisfied the penalty of our disobedience on the cross so that You are pleased with us for our debt is paid. We are not righteous, but You count Christ's righteousness to us. Lord, we long for that day when we will be like You, sinless, never to be tempted again as you put all things under the feet of Jesus Christ, your Son, who is the Lord of heaven and of earth and of the cosmos. And it's in His name that we've worshipped this day and by His authority and His intimacy that He brought as He came to us to bring us and to prepare us for you. In Jesus' name, amen.